Thanks, team. It's been a while since I get up after you guys, and yeah, thank you guys. Good to see everybody here. So good to see you guys, and so good to have you guys tuning in online. Thank you to the tech team for making sure we can stream online. We've had to run a few tests. That's why we took a while to start doing this in the morning. We want to make sure that our online uh, community is included. So thank you guys for setting that up, tech team. Y'all can have a seat. I don't know if we have anybody here for the first time, but if we do, I'm Pastor Chris. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't know if there's anybody tuning in online for the first time. If we do, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, good to have you guys. For those of you guys in person, just a reminder, in case you missed it, Justin Garn uh, and, and Matt Dornacker are going to be hanging out with the kids in the back. Uh, so if you're comfortable with your kids going back there and kind of hanging out, playing some ball a little bit, uh, they're going to be back there, going to be some uh, supervision back there. So they're welcome. There's a bathroom back there. Um, so, yeah, we're all, we're all set up. Um, grab your Bibles if you have them and open up to Matthew, or Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, we're going to be back in our study of Jesus' parables of the kingdom. Uh, we don't have slides, obviously, because we're on location. So even if you're watching online, grab your Bible, whether it's a, a hardback Bible or uh, uh, an app on your phone. Grab it. want you guys to be able to follow along. want you to be able to take notes. Want you want to be able to point out, hey, go back to verse 16, look at that. Okay, so, so get your Bibles handy, all right? Um, we're back in week two of our parables of the kingdom. These are stories that Jesus told to illustrate truths about his kingdom, how the kingdom of God works. And what we said last week was that the kingdom of God is not heaven. It's not the church. The kingdom of God refers to the rule and reign of God. That's what it refers to, the rule and the reign of God. So when Jesus showed up on the scene and said the kingdom of God is here, he meant that the rule and reign of God is breaking into this broken world in the here and now. And he told these parables about everyday things, trees and birds and soils and people finding things in the field and fish, and wheat, and tares, to illustrate truths about how his kingdom worked, oftentimes challenging the expectations and the understanding of his listeners, who had a very different idea of how the kingdom of God worked. They had their own expectations. They, they thought it was going to come a certain way, and so Jesus told these parables to say, it ain't coming the way you thought it was going to come. That was the point of these parables. I want to read an excerpt from an email that I got after last week. They said this. This was, this was not like because my sermon was good. It was because the word of God, in combination with the spirit of God, pierced this person's heart. And I pray it happens to some of you today. They said, I was putting so many different things above Jesus, not just material things, goals or wants. Instead, I was putting right and wrong other people's behavior, anger, and unforgiveness before Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In addition, I was holding resentment and bitterness in my heart towards a few people close to me and a couple of friends in our church as of recent. As of today, I've recommitted my life back to Christ. I need to die to myself. I know some of you guys are like, was it me that they were mad at? <laughs> Ain't that just a, an example of the kingdom of God piercing somebody's the reign and rule of God, and that person saying, I'm welcoming in the reign and rule of God in my life. And that's what I ho hope is going to be the case for more of you today, where you realize there's areas of your life where you need to welcome in the, the reign and the rule of God. I want to remind you guys that we have life groups going through this study. We've got some that are still open. Becky Livingston's got one kicking off this week in, in Jackson. Uh, her and Barbara Hale, we've got other ones where there's still room. So if you're not in a life group, uh, jump in one. They're going to be processing these parables, going deeper with them. So definitely, definitely get in one. Um, let's dive into today's parable. Mar Mark chapter 4. I want to pose this question to you. This is kind of the main point of today. This question. 
what do we do now? That's the main point. What do we do now? What do you do now in response to God's word? That's the question I want you to be thinking about. Uh, and that question came to mind because this past Wednesday night when we had our kids' life group, our kids' life group kicked off, uh, my wife and I and Nicole Raconda and Justin Garn, we were doing this for, at our house for some kids in our, in our church, one of the life groups, and they're going through the parables as well. And so we had the older kids, me and Justin had the older kids in the basement, and we were talking about the parable of the hidden, the man who found the hidden treasure from last week. And my daughter, Sienna, when we were done, she said, what do we do now? And what she meant was, are we doing craft? Are we doing a snack? Can we be done here? Can we go play? And Justin flipped it on her and said, that's a good question. What do you do now? Like, what do you do now with this? Are you going to move on? Or are you going to just say, okay, anyway, onto the snack, onto the marshmallows, onto the, the pirate booty that we have? Or is this going to sink in? Is this going to make a difference? Is this going to affect your life? And so that's my question because that's, that's kind of the point of Jesus' parable today. There's four different responses to his word. There's four different responses to the good news of the kingdom breaking in. What will you do? What response will you have to his word today? What will you do with it? What will you do with it? Let's jump into it. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 2. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seeds fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Okay, we'll stop right there for a moment. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He tells this parable, four different soils, farmer goes out, he's sowing the seed, and then he just ends and says, all right, says to the crowd, right, maybe similar to this crowd, he says, okay, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And that's it. He doesn't interpret it. He doesn't say, now, did you get the moral of the story? He doesn't make sure they understand it. It's like he's saying, okay, if you want to understand it, you'll figure it out. Mic drop. Peace. That's it. And, and it's a little confusing. Why doesn't he help them understand it? Let's continue. Verse 10. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that, and now he's quoting from Isaiah 6, they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and never hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So he's saying, those of you who are still here, you're asking about these parables, you want to know. You want to know about the reign and rule of the kingdom of God. You want to know w w what these truths are about. You're here. The secrets of the kingdom of God have been granted to you. But to those in the crowd who didn't even bother sticking around, to those in the crowd who didn't even want to understand, they ain't going to understand. And I ain't making it any easier. I'm drawing a line here in the sand. Some of you guys, you're given the secret of the kingdom of God, and these parables are drawing you in so that you can go, I want to understand. I want to get it. And others are going, eh, anyway, what's for lunch? Let's move on. I'm hungry. Service went long today. He continues. Verse 13. He said to them, those who are st still around, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So this parable is foundational to understanding the rest. Because, listen, listen, listen. If every other parable is about the kingdom of God, this parable is about our response to the truths about the kingdom of God. If we don't get, it, it, we're not going to get the other parables if we don't have the right response to begin with to the word about the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Hope that makes sense. It'll make sense as we go through this parable. 
So now he explains the parable. Now he's going to get into it. Four responses to the kingdom of God. Four responses to his word. Four responses to the, to the good news of his, of his, his reign and rule. And my question again is, what will you do with it? Which category do you fall into today? What will you do now? What will we do now as a church? Verse 14, the farmer sows the word. Farmer sows the word. That's the seed, the word. Now, who's the farmer? Well, in one sense, it's Jesus. He came. He's, he's God in flesh. He was, the word became flesh. That's the expression of God put on skin. That was Jesus. And he's sowing the good news of the kingdom. But in another sense, because he died and he rose again and he poured out his spirit on his church, you and I are the hands and feet of the farmer. And we get to sow the seed as well. We get to sow the word. We get to, we get to spread the good news of the reign and rule of Jesus breaking into this world. Verse 15. Some people are like seed sown along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So that was the first group. If you remember, Jesus said seed is sown along the path and birds came, took it. And he's saying that that represents Satan, the accuser, the devil, the spiritual enemy who doesn't want the good news of the kingdom to sink into our heads. And so some people, he gets them. They hear this, goes in one ear, out the other ear. Satan comes and takes it away. Doesn't take root. It doesn't move beyond the theoretical. They might even say, that was interesting. I liked that. But then move on. It doesn't take root. It doesn't change. It doesn't pierce their hearts. Some people, Satan will uh, cause them to be antagonistic towards this good news. Right? Be riled up, angry. Maybe he'll use a college professor. Make them feel very enlightened by going against uh, some of the things they grew up learning. But Satan might also use people inside that. He might even use the church itself to inoculate us to the truths of the gospel. He, he might even use, I know some of us, we think that this group of people are not among us in church gatherings. They're not going to watch online. They're not interested at all. I don't think that's necessarily the case. There could be people here today who Satan is lulling to sleep by feeling comfortable in their religious church activity, but never come to a saving knowledge, real relationship with Jesus. The uh, 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon from England saw this in his own church. So this isn't 2020. This is the late 1800s. And he saw it in his own church. People would come in and it would go in one ear, out the other, and they would come back week after week. And he writes, I want to read a quote from him. He said this, do these people come to our assemblies because it is respectable to attend a place of worship? Or is it that their coming helps to make them comfortable in their sins? If they stopped coming, conscience would prick them. But they come here that they may flatter themselves with the notion that they are religious. They come here that they may flatter themselves with the notion that they are religious. That's what some people do. They go to church week after week after week, maybe even, a, maybe even serve and get involved. But it never sinks in. They never know Jesus personally. They never receive his reign and rule in their lives. Now, Jesus said this parable, he's, he, it's kind of like matter of fact. This is going to be the case, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Some people here, some people watching online, some friends and family of ours that we, we sow that seed, it's going to go in one ear out the other, and that's it. Nothing you can do about it. You can't change the soil of their heart. You can't, fix, you can't, you can't persuade them enough. You can't, you know, give them enough books and go, ah, if you only read this book, you'll get it. That ain't, ain't the case. It ain't the case. This is a matter of fact truth. And, and what that means is some of us who invest in people and we sow the seed are going to be discouraged and disappointed. And that's all there is to it. Like, the, expect it. Be encouraged in your discouragement. Jesus said this would be the case. But 
we may not be able to change the soil of their hearts, but the gardener can. He can come in with some tools and start breaking up that soil, right? And so what we can do is pray. We can pray that God, God, break in, do something to the soil of my loved one's heart, my sister, my brother-in-law, my neighbor. Do something to the soil of their heart. We can pray. We must pray. And so at the end of today, I, I, when we have our response time, our band's going to be up here, we're going to have a prayer team down front. And if you're burdened for a family member, a son, a daughter, and you just feel like, man, I'm so in seed. It's been going in one ear, out the other. The birds keep taking it. That, that soil needs to change. We want to join with you in praying. You got to come down with a mask on. Prayer team will have a mask on. But we'll join with you in praying for that family member. That coworker, that neighbor that you're burdened for. Okay, so that's the first group. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Verse 16. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So this is the second category. This is the second category. They love the sound of this Jesus stuff. Look at verse 16. They receive it with joy. You know what that reminds us of? Or reminds me of last week's parable. Of the, uh, there's a plane overhead. Those of you online, I got distracted by the plane. Not used to it. Um, Last week's parable was the man who finds treasure hidden in the field, and it says, in his joy, he went and sold everything to buy that field. So on the surface, this person in this category looks like that guy from last week. It looks like that guy from last week. They, are, they hear the, the, the message of the kingdom of God, and it goes beyond the theoretical. It pierces their heart. And they cry sincere tears of confession and repentance, and they're like, I want that. And they raise their hand, and they come down for prayer, and they get baptized, and they start volunteering. And, 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 and they appear to us to be what we call on fire for God. They're so on fire. Wow, look at them. And they are. They really are genuinely on fire. But the difference between this group and the guy last week who sold everything to buy that field is that they're not willing to pay any price. They're not willing to give up everything. Because what, look at what Jesus says in verse 17. Since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So this refers to direct persecution from other human beings as a result of their faith in Jesus or their profession of faith in Jesus. Could be family members coming against them. Could be co-workers. Could be, could be all kinds of things. But I also think it refers to the indirect trials that come because of Satan throwing stuff at us because he's like, oh, no, you didn't. I'm coming after you. I'm going to try to discourage you from obeying Jesus. Every time somebody gets baptized, I try to, I try to warn them and say, listen, in some ways, life's going to get harder now. Like Satan's going to try to attack you. He's going to try to thwart. He's going to try to discourage you. You might find some old, you know, conflict riling up in your in your family. Your old temptations might come, old addictions. You might kind of start to struggle with them again. You got to be ready to fight against that stuff, because oftentimes I've heard people say things like, "I thought when I got baptized, Jesus was going to make everything okay. All my prayers were going to get answered. That relationship would start to work out." Uh, you know, God's going to protect me from the economic crisis that everybody else is going through. I thought he was going to keep me safe in this little bubble. I thought all that was going to happen, and they start to fall away. They start to get bitter. They start to get, like, what the heck? I thought Jesus was going to be like my magic genie here. And that's just it. They received this good news with joy sincerely, but what they received was their own idea of the kingdom of God. Their own idea of Jesus. They did not truly want the reign and rule of God in their life. They wanted God to bless their reign and rule. They wanted God to bless their kingdom, their kingship. They, they, they wanted simply a blesser 
not a Lord and master. And so they fall away. They get angry. They get bitter. They get discouraged. What the heck? I thought this Jesus stuff was going to work. I guess it's not working. And they start to slip away. Tim Keller, teacher and theologian from New York, put it like this about this group. They thought their problem was that they were a sufferer in need of a solution, when in actuality their primary problem is that they're sinners in need of a savior. And again, Jesus tells this matter of fact. Some people are going to fall in this category. Some people in our churches and our families will fall in this category. They're, we're going to invest in them, and it's going to look like God is doing something amazing. And we're going to get so excited. Wow. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And it's going to be discouraging. And it's going to break our hearts. And it's pretty matter of fact. This is going to happen. Now, as individuals here, I think an implication is to check our own hearts and go, is this me? Is this my response? Do I fall in this category? Maybe you can catch yourself today, right? You can realize that I think I'm slipping away. I think I'm in that category. I'm drifting because I thought God was going to bless this area of my life, and, and he's not. Or I didn't realize he was going to call me to make these kinds of sacrifices that, man, it, these are big sacrifices. I, I, I didn't think he was going to uh, try to tap on this area of my life and tell me to surrender that. And he is. And I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And you start to slip away. You start to pull away. When people leave, have, like, like drift away from our church without, like, a, a conversation, in my experience, and this is just, there's no scientific data, just my experience, it's usually one of two reasons. Number one, they're offended by somebody else in the church, and, and they have this idea like, what the heck? They're hypocrites. You know, I, I thought that church people were going to be better than that, and they offended. Or they're shame. They're, st they're struggling with something, and they don't want to come clean about it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to be challenged about it, so they slip away. If you find yourself slipping away for some reason, Jesus didn't answer a prayer exactly the way you wanted. You find your heart starting to get hard. I want to encourage you to come receive prayer. You can repent of that. You can turn from that and go, God, I don't want to be that kind of soil. I want the roots to go down deeper into my soul. Help me. I got rocks. I got a rocky soil here. I got stone. It's not allowing it to go deeper. Can you, can you do something? Because you can't change the soil of your heart. You can't fix the soil of your heart. The gardener can. He can. He can pull that puppy out. Pull those rocks out. So the prayer team will be down here front again. And if you feel like that might be you, come receive prayer. Just come down and say, man, I think that's my heart. I'm in that second category. I feel like I'm starting to drift and fall away. All right, let's keep going. Number th third category, verse 18. Still others, like seeing sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is the third category. And, and I think generally speaking, and I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but I think generally speaking, this, this is the category, this is the kind of soil that the American church is, Right? Like, we don't deal with the kind of direct persecution that our brothers and sisters in Syria might deal with when they come to know Jesus and they get ostracized from family and they get persecuted by, uh, you know, their, their community, government coming down on them in places like Asia and India. Like, we don't deal with that kind of persecution. What you and I deal with, the obstacles to our faith, the, the, the stuff that we're up against are the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things which choke the word, he says, making it unfruitful. In other words, our, our salvation, we belong to Jesus. Okay? Genuinely have trusted in him. We belong to him, in his family, and yet we are not producing the joy, the peace, the kindness that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us 
nor are we reproducing in others, leading others to know this treasure that is Jesus and his kingdom, leading them to produce that fruit because we, not because we're anti-Jesus, not because we don't want to, it's because we are being choked out, strangled by the worries of this life. The Greek word for worries is marimna, and it comes from a root word which has the idea of a, a distraction which divides, a preoccupation which divides our hearts. And so it's not, it's not evil preoccupations necessarily. Oftentimes it's good things, it's neutral things, it's legitimate things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. It's our kids' birthday parties. And it's uh, plans for Thanksgiving. And it's the renovation to our home. And it's dealing with easy pass violations. And it's dropping your phone in a sink. It's all kinds of little things that you've got to deal with on a daily basis. Deal with your business. It's, 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 in it, our current climate, by the way, right? I mean, we, we live in a time with social media combined with our polarized culture, combined with the current climate of a pandemic and an election season, gives us a lot of things to be preoccupied by, doesn't it? A lot of things. And they're legitimate. They're important things. What are we going to do about COVID precautions? What, what, you know, who am I going to vote for? Those are legitimate concerns, and it's not wrong to be concerned about them. The danger is when we are so preoccupied by them that they divide divide our hearts and strangle out, choke out the fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us and through us. And if you're wondering, is this me? Consider, 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 consider what you post on social media. If you look back at what stuff you post, what does it show that you are preoccupied by? What does it show that you are concerned about? If you find yourself constantly worried about this coming election, for example, or constantly talking about it, it's legitimate, again, but I would venture to say that that worry, if it's turned into a worry, if it's turned into uh, such a, a piece of anxiety in your soul, then it is choking out and strangling what God wants to do in and through you. You are not living up to your spiritual potential. Also notice, Jesus says that the thorns represent not just the worries of this life, but the deceitfulness of wealth. We're being choked out by, this is our, this is the American church, right? Choked out, strangled by our chasing after the happiness that wealth promises but doesn't deliver on promises it, but it doesn't deliver on And again, there's nothing wrong with wealth. By the world's standards, we're all wealthy. There's nothing wrong with wealth. It's when we chase after wealth with the hope that that's going to do it. That's going to fix it. That's going to make me happy. Once I get that renovation done, then I can start serving God. Once I get that promotion, once I can increase my 401k, then I'll feel like I can rest. Then I'll feel at peace. Then I'll feel like I can turn my attention towards getting to know Jesus. Then I can get back to, what in the world? That was an angel saying, amen. <laughs> when we put our hope in that, then it's dividing us. It's dividing our hearts. And listen, some people here might be on the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, right? You don't have a lot of money. You, in, your, in your mind, you're poor. You're lower middle class, and you think this is a problem only the rich and wealthy deal with. Not true. Not true. Some of the people who struggle financially are also some of the greediest people. So obsessed with getting more, so obsessed with oath only and hoarding their stuff. So it's something we can all struggle with, the deceitfulness of wealth. As a church, we are going to, moving into 2021, I'm just going to give you a warning in case you want to leave our church now. Moving into 2021, we're going to talk more about money. 
partly because of stuff that's come up on our membership inventories, conversations with our board, conversations with our pastoral team. We're going to press on that a little bit more. Not because true life needs more money. We ain't looking at our books going, oh, gee, golly, we better start talking about money. That ain't happening. Not at all. It's because we want to see people freed from the deceitfulness of wealth so that they can produce more of the peace and the joy and the kindness and the long-suffering that God's Spirit wants to produce in them and so that they can reproduce that into other people around them and stop being choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth. So as we end, I want to ask you, is this you? Do you feel like you're being choked, that there's thorns in your soil, strangling? One indication, perhaps, is that you're not happy following Jesus. Tim Keller also pointed out, I, I, I think rightly, that this is the only category where you're miserable following Jesus. The first group... The seed on the soil, they, they're, not, they're not following Jesus. There's no, they're, they're like, whatever. Anyway, I'm not even interested. The second group, they do enjoy following Jesus until they don't and they walk away. But this group, this group is like, I want to follow Jesus. I want to worship Jesus. But I also want all these other things. I want to hold on to this area of my life. I, I, I want to make sure my, my career gets off the ground. I want this. I want that. I want to make sure my second grader is being groomed to be an Olympic swimmer. I want all these things. Can I have it all? And it's choking us, and we're miserable. That's an indicator, potentially an indicator, that there's thorns in your heart, that there's preoccupation. And I want to encourage you, come down and be prayed for. Be prayed for. Let's let's go to the gardener and say, gardener, please take these thorns out of my heart. I, I don't want to be preoccupied by these things. This past Thursday, our prayer and fasting Thursday, I uh, I was recognizing in my own heart some things that I'm like, I don't want my mind to keep going back to that. Like God, help me care less about these things, and help me care more about the things that you care about, right? Because you could say on paper that these are the things you care about, you know, all this stuff that God cares about, but you can tell that your mind drifts. I don't know if anybody else deals with this. It's like my mind gets like a, like, like takes the bait of something, and it just starts, it's like, ah, it's trapped. I keep thinking about this thing, and I can't stop. It's like, God, cut me loose from this thorn. If you feel like I need to be cut loose from a couple thorns in my heart, prayer team going to be praying for you. I'm going to join with you in praying. Gardener can do it. You can pluck those puppies out. Another indication that this might be you, this third category, is if you want, let's read, the, let's read this last verse here, verse 20. If you want this to be true of you and you don't feel like it is. Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60 some a hundred times what was sown. If you want this to be you, I want to see more fruit being produced than I already am. And listen, some are going to be 60, some 30, some 100. We can't compare ourselves to each other. That's a dangerous game. Don't do that. But if you can recognize with discernment that, you know what? Jesus saved me. He put his spirit in me so that I can now produce this character be ever growing in my joy and my peace and my patience and my kindness and my long suffering, leading others to find their treasure in Jesus, find their joy in Him. I want to be more effective in that. I want to help other people find Jesus as their treasure. And you feel like you're not, there's a disparity between that, could be you, there could be thorns in the way. And again, I encourage you to come down. Ask the gardener. Let's, let's join you in asking the gardener to pluck those thorns out. So I'll end with the question, what will you do now? What will we do now? What do we do now? Let's have the band come back up. And... 
Let's have our prayer team come down front. And again, if you want to come down for prayer, please wear a mask. Whether you're burdened for yourself or for a friend or a family member and you want to pray for them during this time as we sing some closing songs, you can come down and receive prayer. Everybody else, I would encourage you to stand and worship. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Let the gardener mess around with your heart a little bit. Jesus, I pray for the men and women here today. Pray for the teenagers here today, the young adults, the old adults. Jesus, the primary categories that you put us in are not based on our gender or our socioeconomic status, our ethnicity or our race. The primary categories are how we respond to the good news of your reign and rule in this world. Are we going to move on today? Not let this penetrate our hearts at all? Are we going to be excited about it up until a trial comes our way? Are we going to say we want to serve you, but also serve many other things at the same time? Or are we going to be among those who produce a crop 30 or 60 or 100 fold? Jesus, help us. For those who have ears to hear, help us. Help us repent what we need to repent of. You are our faithful and good gardener. And I believe that whatever it takes to mess with the soil of our hearts, whatever tools you use, it's because you love us. You're so gracious and faithful. Would you do that today? Be our faithful gardener. Amen.